Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Digital Today's podcast. I am Dave. I'm Ron. And Ron, we've got episode 223 today. It's the Montpelier episode. Montpelier. Montpelier is well, uh, by my first apartment phone number was a 223 phone number. I don't remember what the last part it was, but that was my first apartment in Montpelier in 1992. Eventually, I met my wife and all that. So this will be the Montpelier episode today. All right, the Montpelier episode. All righty. And on episode 223, Ron, we're mm-hmm. going to be shooting some threes. Do you like yes. that? Do you like that segue? Do you like the segue? <laughs> From downtown. From downtown, we're shooting some threes on episode 223 as we are joined by author Adam Cribley, and his book is Kings of the Garden, the New York Knicks and Their City. Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. All right, so we're going to be getting uh, deep into some basketball talk today. Before we do that, ways to get a hold of us, digitaltodice.com is the website. 978-751-DICE is the text line. Digitaltodice at yahoo.com is the email. And over on Facebook, facebook.com slash groups slash digitaltodice. All right, Adam, before we get in to your book about the Knicks, we do have one question we ask all our guests that come on the show. And that question would be, if you could go back in time and attend any sporting event, what would that event be? You know, I, I, I'm glad that I, I regularly listen. So I, I anticipated this and had time to think about it. Um, so, you know, writing a book about the Knicks, the, the, the one I would have loved to see is the 1970 NBA Finals. Game seven, Willis Reed limps out to the court, dragging his leg behind him. Uh, and, and just that moment in Madison Square Garden uh, is, is probably the, the one I would have to, have to go back and watch because you can, you can hear the electricity on the, you know, the YouTube recording or whatever, but I can only imagine just the garden going insane that night. Interesting. Yeah. I thought he was going to say the uh, the Russian USA basketball game that Russia won at, at the buzzer. <laughs> I was worried he was going to say the miracles of Meadowlands, but <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. All right, that's a good one. That's a that's a new one. We haven't had that one, so that that's a new okay. one. Yeah, that's a good one. I like I like hearing what people have to say because it's kind of everyone's um, favorite event is is different. It's it's nice to hear that when we chat here on the show. All righty, so let's get into your your book here, The Kings of the Garden, the New York Knicks. In their city, I guess my first question would be, why the Knicks? So great question. Um, they obviously had, uh, you know, I call, I talk about in the book like the golden age Knicks of the early seventies, in which they won two NBA championships and had a legendary team. Lots of books uh, written about them. You know, a thirty for thirty about uh, when the Garden was Eden. And then uh, on the other side is is kind of what you know I call the Silver Age, the the Ewing led team that had uh, you know Patrick Ewing and John Starks, Charles Oakley, this you know brute, brute enforcer kind of team, um, and then there was the team between them. So I, I got interested in this in this uh, team um, and was told by publishers, you know, when I first started talking to them, like no one wants to read a book about losers. And I said, well, uh, you know, it's I think it's significant. I still think it's important. So yeah, the the Knicks. It wasn't necessarily because. They were my favorite team forever, but it was just such an interesting team. I felt like I needed to write about it. What, what kind of research went into doing this book? Like, where did you kind of start with this? You know, work, work us from like the, the early days to kind of finishing up here. Sure. So um, I published a book previously in 2016, I guess, called Tall Tales and Short Shorts, which was about the NBA in the 1970s. And so I was pretty familiar with books uh, about that period. I've got a, uh, you know, all the basketball digest um, little magazine things for about a 15 year period. So I had a lot of that on hand. Um, Do I can't figure out about basketball digest. One second there. I I got the hockey digest and the baseball digest, right? Mm -hmm. You would think basketball digest would be a little taller. <laughs> you know, then the hockey died just in the, that would be great marketing because, you know, basketball well, players yeah. are tall. It's like, wouldn't you want a magazine that's just like a little taller than hockey digest and baseball digest? I should have been a marketer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, that, I mean, that was, that was kind of how it started is I started looking at that stuff. And then, so I'm a, I'm a university professor, so I have access to a great library. So I just started ordering, um, you know, had the library get me, 
books and newspaper, like microfilm. Um, I started doing that. I did take a research trip out to New York, and um, then I decided I was going to uh, do some interviews. So I actually called and was able to talk to about 25 people associated uh, either players or coaches, or I talked to the ball boy, right? Like I talked to a lot of people associated with the Knicks. So um, yeah, it was about a four year, four year process of really just researching. Okay. Was there any other team you thought about doing or was this going to be Knicks all the way? Yeah. So the, the other team that I considered doing was the, was the Boston Celtics because they kind of had a similar roller coaster ride where they were really good in the mid seventies. And then again in 1980 when Larry Bird arrived, but they had a couple rough seasons in there. So those were the two teams, like the Knicks and the Celtics were uh, very similar teams for whatever reason I was interested in really great franchises that had a rough patch. Okay. What's your main, what's your main draw to seventies basketball, I guess, overall for the NBA, that seems like the Nader. I mean, they did merge with the ABA. They did get Dr. J eventually, although he didn't stay in New York with, with the Nets and all that. I mean, if you were to, Pick an era of basketball that, you know, maybe is the most loathed of it all. I would say it would be the 1970s. So uh, w- w- what's your draw to that? Yeah, I, you mentioned all the things. Um, so it was, a, it was a league that didn't have a super team. It was a league that its biggest superstars, uh, one was, you know, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Mm-hmm. And he didn't like the media very much. And the media really didn't like him that much. And so... Um, they didn't. They didn't maybe treat him as a as a megastar. Um, there were there was a lot of parody. Like there were you know the Washington Bullets and the Seattle SuperSonics won won NBA titles. Uh, so for me that was the draw. And Ron, as you mentioned, the the merger coming in 1976, it was a huge time of transition. The NBA went from I believe a dozen teams in 1967 to 23 I think by 1980. So huge growth, huge expansion. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to me, it was just this this time in transition was really interesting. Okay. And obviously, the time of New York City. You know, I mean, when, when, when I read the blurb on your book, the first thing that popped into my head was the Daily News headline, Ford of New York, drop dead. You know, yep. when, when New York was going through bankruptcy in 75 and the basketball thing, that's, you know, the end of Clyde Frazier. He goes to Cleveland for crying out loud. Um, short, short, short nets and uh, – the Knicks being relegated to the uh, eleven thirty regional slots on CBS <laughs> on a Thursday night because Carson has a good guest on, you know. So what would obviously, you know, without reading the book, um, the ties between the down, you know, New York's awkward middle school years, let's say, and the NBA's awkward middle school years, they really are there. I, it was something I hadn't thought of until I saw what your book was about. Was, was that something that you went through as a premise, or did that come to you as you were starting to do some research? Um, it, I started as a premise, and so for me, the, the premise was actually connected more to music. So it was okay. more to me connected to this is the rise of punk rock in New York City, this is the rise of hip-hop music in New York City. 54. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I mean, this is this so that was the tie that I initially wanted to make, but then mm-hmm. after I started doing more research, it was you're absolutely right. Like this is New York City struggles uh, mirrored in the Knicks, and so as the Knicks went, so did the city in some ways. And uh, right, and so the return of you, you know, the arrival of Ewing in '85, while the city's kind of turned things around, kind of forms a fitting like bookend to the backside of the story. Mm-hmm. If someone asked you what this book was about. About what would you say, and, and and also what is the time? Like, where did you kind of start with the Knicks, and where did you end up? What is the time frame of the book, and what is it about? So the book starts in 1975, roughly. Uh, the Knicks won the NBA title in 1973. Uh, they still had a good season in '74, but '74 is kind of the end of the road for that that era. So it's 1975 to '85. Um, I, I do a little bit before and a little bit after, but it's mostly that decade, and it's kind of two parts. So on one hand, it's a story of the Knicks. So I talk about the trades they made, the the actual things going on on the court, the behind the scenes stuff with free agents and and that sort of thing. But it's also about New York City. And so as as Ron mentioned, like I talk about the Ford to City drop dead headline. I talk about the uh, Bronx is burning, you know, famously from the 1977 World Series. Um, I talk about the uh, the son of Sam killer um, and and so all of those things you know the AIDS epidemic of the early 80s like all these things kind of 
come in and out uh, as the story of the Knicks is kind of the, the thing that ties them all together. But it's so it's about basketball. I mean, it's a basketball book for sure, but it also includes a lot more that people who are just interested in history of the period should should enjoy. See, I, I like that. Um, I, re- I read a book on the uh, the Kansas City Scouts of the uh, yeah. NHL and they came in 74, 75. So we're talking the same kind of time frame here. And, um, and this book here, the, the author really did a good job of like painting the picture of what was going on in America, in an American sports at the time. And again, he talks about a few other things like you just talked about. I think that's really important when you're writing a book, even about sports is to include things that are kind of, you know, going on in the external, you know, so we're not just focused on hockey or basketball, but what was going on at the time? Let's set the mood. Let's paint the picture. So you have an idea. When I start talking about the Knicks in 75, here's what was going – just in case you didn't know or forgot, here's what's going on. And it was a very different time, and it was a very different way of thinking and, and a way of life. And, uh, you know, when we had um, uh, J. Thomas Hedrick on about the, the Cleveland Spiders, which was, you know, 1899 baseball, you know, he was painting a picture of, you know, the, the, the turn of the century and that, you know, it was trains. They were getting to the games and trains and, you know, there were games were getting called at six o'clock for darkness. So he really set the mood of, of that time frame. So it sounds like that you've kind of done that with your book. It's kind of set the mood of the era. That's the goal. Yeah. I mean, and, uh, and I'm, I'm familiar with Jay Thomas's books and he absolutely does that. Uh, but I, th- I do think it's important so that readers have an idea of what it was like for those players to play in those conditions. Yeah, I mean, because you're not going to sit there and get on a cell phone in 1975. So you got to let people know that the phone rang. Literally, the phone rang, you know, and I was uh, in the bathroom or I was in the garage and didn't hear it. And that's why I didn't get on the team because I didn't answer the phone. You know? So right. things like that are a real thing, you know. Absolutely. So as far as the Knicks and their fall, I mean, every team has rises and every team has falls. Um, specifically, what didn't they do right after Holtzman left and Frazier retired and Bradley became a politician and all that, I mean, why, why did it? Why did they have that ten years or eight year stretch? Because they had some good players. My friend Jerome Preisler wrote the book on with Bernard King, so it wasn't like the Knicks were barren. They weren't the Clippers or anything like that. But but why why did they just besides getting old? What what happened with the Knicks? So part of it was as the league expanded, obviously the talent diffuses and because the Knicks continue to be good, they weren't getting young, talented collegiate players through the draft. Right. Um, And the ones that they did draft didn't pan out as they expected. Uh, And this is in the era before free agency. So they just couldn't open their checkbooks and go out and buy players. Uh, And so surprisingly, and we see this today, teams don't want to trade with the good teams because they don't want to make them better. And so, uh, the Knicks for yeah, tr- trades, draft picks. Um, it's funny, you know, being a being a modern NBA fan is looking at the the Knicks seem to be chasing, and they're having a great season this season. They seem to be chasing the next great New York superstar, and have been for for years and years. And so uh, it was kind of funny to me to see that they were doing the same thing in the seventies as, as right. they still are. <sighs> Yeah, and of course, you know, with the Celtics and, and trades and then, I mean, Danny Ainge's era is going to go on for a long, long time. He left them in very good, good shape. So, it, obviously, you know, if you go, you know, t- chasing that superstar, I guess my next question is, there seems to be a connection, and for Dave and I are not huge basketball fans, where there is a deep connection between the city and the Knicks, that those of us who aren't necessarily fans of basketball don't quite understand. It's obviously there for the Yankees and us in New England really don't don't want to talk about that. And the Giants have always just you know the the six, but there just seems to be this deep deep connection with the Knicks, the Garden, and the city. Maybe you can explain why that it you know why that is because it's not like the Knicks have got 17 championship banners I'm not I'm not being cruel here but it's not like they're the Yankees or anything like that of course yeah so um I I was asked this question earlier you know in a different context and and had to think about it and so I think that there's really three levels of New York City and basketball okay on one hand there is the playground game in which Park yeah, exactly. Rucker Park, um, this sense that every New Yorker plays basketball, and that's not obviously true, but it's the one sport that you can play easily 
in New York City. There's not a lot of baseball parks downtown. There's not a lot of space for football. There's not a lot of hockey rinks downtown that are accessible. Um, and so basketball is a sport that can be played a lot outside and expensively. And so on one hand, you have the, you know, it's a playground game. On the other, right. beginning in the beginning in like the 1930s, Madison Square Garden was the mecca for college basketball. Yes. And so the biggest college basketball games were held in the garden. Uh, and so it gains a mystique there. And then in the 1970s with the Knicks, they become this, this great team. And so there's at all levels, there's playground basketball, there's college basketball. Some of the best high school basketball in the country has been and is mm-hmm. played in New York City. And so... It's pervasive, you know, from from the time you can walk until the time you're cheering, you know, the Knicks, and when you're when you're old and gray, that um, there's always basketball in New York City, and it's always you, you, you had mentioned Kareem, and he's from New York, Power Memorial, exactly. Interesting. What were some of the challenges and hurdles you had when putting this book together? Uh, so one big challenge was the actual interviews themselves. I reached out to a lot more players than actually responded, um, and those that responded, it's tough because. They remember the game or they remember playing, you know, it's 40 years later. And so they they remember things maybe a little differently than they actually took place. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I had to deal with a little bit of that. Uh, another challenge was just the, the challenge of getting a book published. It's figuring out the right press, the right publisher, um, whether to have an agent or not, whether to self-publish. I mean, there's a lot of things that go into it. And again, fortunately for me, this was... This is book number three. I'm, I'm a professor, and so that helps kind of open some doors that may not otherwise be open to authors. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, just, I mean, those challenges. I, I finished, I think, my very last full draft – or, my sorry, my very first full draft – in 2021 and it's being published three years later. Like it's just, it's a long drawn out process. And so challenges of, of patience and then challenges of just access to the interviews and sources that I wanted to, to have. When you, when you talk, I know there's other interviews we've done and I've done outside of the show and, and that when you normally talk to a retired ball player in baseball and football and hockey, they're very open with their stories. They, first of all, they want to be remembered. And second of all, they have a lot of good things to share and you can share about half of it with, with the general public. Is that the case for the NBA players or, or are they a little more guarded about what they want to share about their past? It, it varied based on player. Um, most of them, most of them gave vanilla answers. That, you know, how, what was it like to be on the Knicks? Well, it was great. It was it was a dream come true. Okay, well that's that's an answer, but it really doesn't tell me much. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I would, you know, I obviously I would push more than that general questions. But right. some of them were pretty guarded. Some of them were pretty hesitant. Uh, others others just you know, didn't, didn't really want to talk much about any kind of controversy. So they wanted to, they wanted to re- relive the glory days, but they didn't want to talk about the hard questions. And so, as I mentioned earlier, like the 1979 Knicks become the first all black NBA team. Well, oh, okay. most of the, most of the guys that I talked to said, well, it wasn't a big deal and, and kind of wanted to move on. So those were, those were certainly challenges that I had. Was there anything what, crazy or out of the ordinary in the book, you, without giving it all away, but some, a little little tidbit you could share with us about uh, something that, like, oh, you wouldn't believe this, and that's in the book? Yeah, so one of my favorites is a story, and it's it's this is, is has made the rounds some, but is that there was a player on the team named Michael Ray Richardson, an incredibly uh-huh. talented, incredibly talented player, Ron knows Sugar, Sugar Ray Richardson. Yep. Um, and so he was interviewed by reporters after a game and, uh, you know, they asked him how the, the team was doing poorly. And they asked, you know, you know d- how do you, how do you see this going? Like uh, what's the direction we're headed? And he, and Michael Ray said, the ship be sinking. Um, and the, the reporters then followed up and they say, well, how low will it sink? And he said, well, the sky's the limit. And uh, <laughs> it, was just, it was a great line. And, and so there's, that's probably the most well-known one, but there's a lot of, a lot of ones like a uh, lot of little fun quotes like that from the newspapers and from the players that, that are just, they're, they're fun. And they, and they kind of give you a, a glimpse. One, another one was, and this was uh, uh, Michael Ray Richardson's sister um, talked about her brother having been in, in, uh, in, in New York. And, and she said it was like Jethro went to the big apple. Like he was just this kind of country boy and now he's in the big city. And he would, another story I heard is he would, uh, he would drive the wrong way down one way streets in this very noticeable car. I mean, he's just, just was a real character. And so lots of Michael Ray stories in the book. Were the players cognizant of the cultural changes going on in the city when things, you know, with the, the hip hop and 
breakdancing is the big memory I have from the from the early to mid to mid eighties, and that stuff that was coming out of the city. And uh, I can't imagine anyone told you, yeah, I snorted coke off a of mirror at <laughs> Studio Fifty Four. We'll still be monetized for this, right? Um, but you know, I mean, how how much of of the city's groove were those players in or aware of? So that's a great question. The during the season, most of them were not really engaged in it, right? So they mm-hmm. they're traveling a lot, and even when there's home games, yes, they're going out to parties and they're and they're doing those sorts of things. But in general, they were kind of keeping it buttoned down during the season. In the off season, they were very clearly. Um, part of the of, of the culture. Some of them actually lived in Manhattan. A lot of them actually lived in in New Jersey or kind of outside of the city and commuted in. Uh, so those those guys were a little less engaged in in New York City culture. But mm-hmm. um, there's a great story. So Bob McAdoo was one of their better players, and he was mm-hmm. about six foot ten, and he loved going to the clubs. And so you know this giant six foot ten, well dressed African American man would would get out of a get out of the the limo and and. Um, they would talk about how the, the the crowds would part like the Red Sea because McAdoo was coming into the clubs, and so he was. You know, there were certainly some that were that were very into the the club culture, the Studio Fifty Four kind of culture of the time. McAdoo played for the Lakers too, so he got it on both coasts. He it did, yeah. He got, in some of those years, I would say, yeah, he got his ring in in L.A. So uh, obviously you go from the basketball part of the book, from the drafting of Ewing and, and how the Knicks rebuilt and survived Patino. And, and, and again, almost full circle with uh, Pat Riley coming back to, to build those teams in the nineties. When do you think that the city started to rebound from drop dead? So by, by about 1984, 85, the, the balance was, or the budget was balanced again. The, um, you know, the New York Mets were on the rise. The, uh, the, the Times Square had been cleaned up a little bit. Some of the, some of the um, you know, dirty movie theaters in Times Square were gone. Mm-hmm. There had been a concerted effort at that. There was some efforts made at, at kind of cleaning up the streets, at, at lowering crime, and, and they'd had successes. So I would say by, by 1984-85, it was certainly on a different trajectory mm-hmm. than, it, than it was um, a decade earlier. But there wasn't like a defining moment when someone, when other politicians or community leaders said, that's enough. Yeah, I mean, there was, there was. um, And uh, Mayor Koch was, was big into that. And so around 1980, there's a task force created. that's basically the Times Square cleanup task force. Because the problem is that visitors are coming into New York and that's where they want to go. That's what they see. And so it's it's an embarrassment for the city that that there's peep shows and there's you know dirty movie theaters and everything's in neon um, and and so it's it's I would say Times Square best epitomizes that transformation from like mm-hmm. seedy dirty New York City to glamorous um, expensive city. Mm-hmm. Okay, what was um what was your favorite thing either about this book or your favorite thing that's in the book? If you're like, oh man, this is. So I would say my favorite thing about this book was uh, was that I'm I'm big into you know video games, board games, and stuff. Is is like reading more about these players and learning more about the players that I enjoyed playing with on on video and board games. And so uh, that's why you know I, I I love books about specific teams that I'm interested in or, or players that I'm interested in playing. Um, and so that was that was a lot of fun for me. That was that was one thing I really enjoyed with the book. Uh, I enjoyed you know seeing the finished product in hand. Uh, at the end because it had been seven or eight years in the, in the making. Uh, so, th- so that was exciting. Um, and, and, and really like just being able to see all the time that I'd put into it to see the finished product was. How do you keep that important. fire going, Adam? So we're, we're talking with Adam Cribbley and his book, Kings of the Garden in New York next. How do you keep that fire going for so many years? Cause myself, you know, I get hot on a project to whatever it is and I get into it and I've done a little bit of writing myself and I, I do a little bit of music from time to time. So I get, okay. And for like a handful of days, I start writing or I start composing music and th- then it, it just kind of fades out. Now I couldn't imagine writing, starting to write something and over time and then, Say, boy, I hope in seven years I'll be done with this. I just don't think I have the, um, the, the, the patience, maybe that's the word, or just the, you know, I don't know what word I'm, I'm looking for, but, you know, th- that's a long time from a start of a product to the end. How did you keep that flame going? 
So I, I didn't anticipate it being a seven year project when it started, which, which helps. Um, it was, it was going along really well. And then 2020 happened and, and it got, you know, it, it, it got hit, put it on the pause button for a while. But for me, it was about finding, finding something I enjoyed from it. And so um, I might research in some newspapers for a while, and then I would go and watch some game film. I, you know, I watched lots of, uh, of, of, basketball games from that period. And then I'd go and listen to some hip hop music from the seventies from that period. And so I was managing to jump around kind of mini project to mini project within the book. Uh, and then once I actually started writing, I would work on a chapter for a while. And then when I got bored with this, with that chapter, I would start on another chapter. And so I didn't write the book from beginning to end. Um, I actually started somewhere in the middle with the 1979 season. And then um, I didn't do a full, like, start to finish until I'd already been working on it for a couple of years. So at that point I actually sat down with about eight cups of coffee and mm. started the book and went through and, and went through the whole thing to make, and then, and then started working on making it coherent. But yeah, it was about finding those mini projects within the bigger project to keep me entertained and focused at, at, at the same time. Is there one player on the Knicks that you, I mean, we talked about the big stars over the years, but maybe just kind of, impressed you the most or the story that interested you the most outside of Michael Ray Richardson while you were putting this together? Yeah. So, uh, so obviously Michael Ray was, was a fun one. Um, but I, you know, I, one of the players that I, I really came to, uh, to appreciate one of those, one of those turning point moments, there was a guy named Travis, um, uh, Travis Knight. No, Toby Knight. Thank you. Toby Knight, uh, who okay. was a forward on the team. And so they had, they had this wonderful, wonderful, young, exciting team, um, and Toby Knight was a 20 point almost, I think he averaged right around 20 a game, uh, forward out of, out of Notre Dame and going into the, the next season, everything looked like they were on the, on the move doing great. Uh, and then, uh, Knight blew out a knee and that derailed the season. And so, um, although he wasn't like, he's one of those guys that literally I knew nothing about. I've never before, heard of him. Yeah. Before, before doing any research, I never heard of him. Uh, but he was. He was one of those guys that, and and that's one of those things that makes the project rewarding is finding out these people that are not the Walt Frazier's of the world that are right. that are kind of the hidden gems that oh I never knew this guy scored twenty points a game or a guy named Truck Robinson that that averaged twenty and ten I mean it just um, those were the things that really were interesting to me these kind of second tier players that really mattered right. Right. Okay. So you mentioned you're a gamer, and we talked about this. You're a gamer, and so uh, first of all, what basketball games do you play? So basketball, um, there are there are a couple. Uh, so one that you know, one uh, your last episode or one of your most recent was about games that clicked for you. Yes. And um, replay basketball clicked for me. The that's the a first good one. I played it. I that sat down. Game. Yeah, and then like it made total sense that mm-hmm. you read the numbers from each player's chart like it um i i loved being able to just glance at it and see oh a bunch of number ones on here this guy's pretty good or number you know number fives and right so so that one that one clicked pretty pretty quickly for me uh, i also heard you guys talking about the stratomatic basketball the the board the the computer game version of that clicks for me but for some reason the actual board game i really have a, a hard time with uh, the 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 computer game is just it's the best of them and, yep, that, and that's you know yeah and so i guess my follow-up question is you probably own most of those seasons even at, at strats rates it must be fun to play i guess this isn't really a question more of a statement it must be fun to play about the people you wrote about Absolutely. You know, were you able to ever? Uh, here's a question: Were you able uh, ever able to get the Knicks a championship that they didn't get, or further than the, than they didn't get in in that era, or was Celtics, Sixers, Lakers just too strong? If you if you've gone that far, yeah. So I, I have done that on the Strat game, the the computer game. Right. And despite my despite my managerial uh, talents. Was was never able to get them. Uh, so I really enjoy playing the the late seventies, early eighties seasons. So the the Michael Ray Richardsons, uh, Bill Cartwright played on those teams before he was Michael Jordan's sidekick in in Chicago. Um, I was never able to to really get them going. The the last time that I was able to do so was uh, I used to be very big into the uh, the video game, the NBA Live video games, yes, um, the NBA Two K video games, and mm-hmm. so. 
I could I could do that with them, but uh, but on cards and dice, no, I just I never really had any any luck um, making the Knicks better than they were. You you keep mentioning those names, and in my head, I can hear Marv Albert on WNBC calling those games. The power of fifty thousand watts at sixty six on the AM dial certainly came into Northern New England, and on a night when I was bored, you know, okay, Celtics aren't playing. Oh, listen to the Knicks for a little while and fall asleep. So Rory. <laughs> Sparrow and Trent oh, yeah. Tucker and Bernard King. So, yeah, so it's interesting that that got out of the city in the pre-internet cable. Yeah. And he gets the game. friendly role. <laughs> <laughs> I love Marv Alba. He did the Rangers games. He did the Knicks. I, I, I uh, really... You know, red light me seen. How much of a rivalry was, was there with the Rangers? With the, the, oh, the, 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 the New York, the, the hockey team, because they were owned by the same people that played in the same arena and the Rangers made the finals in 79. Yeah. So there was the, the, the only controversy that I really saw, cause there's a lot of overlap between Rangers fans and Knicks fans. So that right. was a really big deal, but it was that the Rangers. So Sonny Werblin comes in to run Madison square garden and hires a new coach for the, the Rangers and brings in a couple of internet. I'm the names are slipping through my brain right, right. now, but, couple international stars and and makes it to the finals and and so people start looking and saying well Sonny why aren't you doing that with the Knicks well you know why why aren't you buying great players and 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 so there was there was definitely some frustration that the Knicks couldn't come in and just turn it around as quickly as the Rangers did Mm -hmm. (laughs) so what would you consider your favorite era of basketball and what are your thoughts on modern basketball uh, so I love basketball in all its forms. And so I, I think I've become Zen enough to appreciate, um, appreciate the game as it's evolved. Uh, I, I certainly, I don't prefer the modern game. Like if I'm choosing a game from all of the games I've ever watched to watch, I'm probably not going to watch a modern game, but I do, you know, I enjoy it. I, I like watching it. I, I can appreciate the the talent and how the game's changed. Um, I can also appreciate the grinded out 1990s style bad boys Pistons games that end 88 to 87, and there's you know fouls and punching and uh, yeah, um, I mean, the next made the two finals of that decade. Sure, exactly, yeah. So so I can appreciate those, uh, but really, uh, you know, I, I I grew up on and and grew to love basketball in the late 80s. So in the Larry Bird era, the Magic Johnson era. Um, where the, the three-pointer was a shot that you took at the end of a shot clock or if you had to desperately try to come back. And so I really enjoy the, you know, you throw the ball to the center and people are moving all around the court. And um, so in terms of, like, modern, actually, modern women's college basketball, you know, Ron joked about Caitlin Clark earlier, but, like, the, the, uh, the, the you know, she was the first pick for the, for the Knicks in 1985 in the, in the draft lottery, but... Uh, modern women's college basketball kind of has the same flavor as it, almost absolutely. The NBA. Absolutely. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's become a thing. It's because it's closest to the type of style of game that was played when we were in high school and we can relate to it. You know, I, I think that's one of the things. So the, okay. So my next question is if you were, if someone who was younger, that's listening to the show and it would be younger than 52. So let, let's say, uh, you know, someone who who watched, you know, Kobe Bryant was their favorite player growing up. If you were to go to YouTube and put on the Brent Musburger and Rick Barry show from 1977, what about 70s basketball was should be enjoyable or, you know, different from, from obviously it's a, it's a much different game. I mean, there wasn't a three-point shot. When did they have the know, shot clock? When did that come in? 54. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, I, oh, there was, oh. there was a, a before, okay. <laughs> uh, before I let Adam answer that question, there was a game between Minneapolis and I think the forerunners of the Detroit Pistons, Fort yep. Wayne, back in the 52 53 season without a shot clock. And they just played four corners, hold the ball. And I think the final score was 13 to 12. Something like that. Yeah. And that's why they put in the shot clock because they didn't want people to sit there oh. and go, you sit there with a two point lead and you could literally hold the ball for 20 minutes. Yeah. All right, Adam. <laughs> so what about seventies basketball, you know, is underappreciated. Maybe that's, there we go. Yeah. So the thing that, the thing that I really grew to appreciate was that every team kind of had a different style. Mm-hmm. Um, not that they, not that they all play the same now because there are certainly variations, but much of the modern game is, is you drive it 
to the basket. And if you can't score going to the basket, you throw it out and somebody shoots a three. Um, right. And, and there, again, there are variations. I love, for example, Nikola Jokic because he's a giant man who can stand outside and shoot and pass and all the things. He's bird. Um, he's yeah, exa- bird. yeah, he's like a seven-foot version. Uh, but – so the seventies, everybody, every team has a different style. And so you would see, for example, in the seventies that, um, you know, the Celtics with Jojo white and John Havlicek and Dave Cowens, they would, you know, throw the ball into Cowens, but Cowens could shoot a, a good jump shot and Havlicek would run them all up and down the court the whole game. And, in Kansas City, the Kansas City Kings had Tiny Archibald, who led the league in points and assists in a season, and so and then later played for the Celtics. And right. so their their offense revolved around get the ball to Tiny and get out of the way. Um, you know, you had teams that uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you threw the ball into him, and he was the center, so he would take his big sky hook. Uh, so to me, it was that every team just had a different identity, uh, mm-hmm. and that and that it was reflected in their style of play. Um, and so that 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 was the excitement to me is is it was it was maybe sloppier, but also I think uh, again more more unique in terms of how it was played. Okay. Hey, uh, when it comes to pro basketball, talking about here, pro basketball, was there any rule you think made the game worse, or was there any rule to think you made the game that made the game better? What are your thoughts on that? So the the three point line actually absolutely made the game better. Um, it spread out the court. It it allowed for people who were not the tallest person on the team to be a, a great player. That's a good point. Uh, so yeah. that, that one was one. Um, you know, I also I also do like, and this is a controversial one sometimes, but I like the closer foul calls. So I like that players can't grab and hold and like they used to in the '80s and '90s because it allows for great players to be great and not to just be held and 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 pushed and, and that sort of thing. There's so um, much bigger today than they were even 30 years ago. I mean, it just doesn't, it, it's just hard to believe it's just 10 men in 30 yards, but they're, they're just huge. Yeah. So the, I mean, those, are, those are rule changes I like for sure. Um, you know, I, I can't say that there are any rule changes I dislike um, that there's anything that, that really pops out, but uh, I, you know, I, things to me like, you know, when they get technical fouls for hanging on the rim, I, I just, you know, that kind of stuff drives me a little nuts, but, but in general, yeah, no, I, I think that the game has evolved for the better in the last, you know, 40 or 50 years. Okay. I got one more question over here. What, what did you learn during this whole process of writing this particular book? What was something that you learned? Uh, so two things I learned. One is that I, I need to continue to be patient because again, I didn't expect seven years <laughs> from the start of research till, till it's, it's publishing. Um, but, but I, but I learned that as, as we talked about earlier, I knew it was important, but the connections between a city and a team uh, and a fandom and a culture that it's hard to, you know, it's hard to really understand unless you're part of that. And Mm -hmm. this idea that, that uh, I, you know, I heard plenty of, of fans talk about, you know, the Celtics as we, you know, we went to the playoffs in 1984. Um, they didn't play on the team, but for them, it was a significant part of, of how they understood themselves. And so the, 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 again, the idea that a team is so connected to its city was, was probably the most important thing that I learned and, and better understood through the process. Okay. What advice would you have for me? I, I've been running a hockey league now for 25 years, and I thought it'd be fun to write a book about 25 years of, of running a league. Uh, what advice would you have for me as I start to put this book together? Uh, yeah. So one is find joy in it. If it, you know, that's a thing that you really love doing. Um, I see so many times people and, and my students, they write about a topic that they really don't, they're really not passionate about, but they think it's a good topic to write about. And so I, I know you have passion for that league. And so you've already passed the first hurdle. Um, but, but another one is if you're going to do interviews with, with people that have participated in played in the league, don't wait. Um, because that's, you know, that's a mistake that I made is there were a couple people that I wanted to interview that, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, either were later unwilling or, or had passed away, uh, that, that weren't able to do interviews with me. So, uh, you know, doing it sooner than later. And, and the last piece of advice is start writing before you think you're ready to write. So I started, you know, my, my first words to paper were a few months after I'd started researching, I continued to research for three more years, but, but I'd started writing cause you can, there's no end to research. You could, you could, I'm sure, dig through the stats of that league and talk to people and try to find connections to, to people that had played. And, um, 
and then never actually start typing the book. So those are, those are my recommendations oh, and, and because of a lot of past failures on my part. So it's mm. learning through my failure failures. Mm-hmm. Nice. So uh, I guess a, cu- a couple of questions. The one that popped in my head first was, is that connection between the Knicks and the city stronger, weaker? Where does it stand in 2024? If you had asked me six months ago, I would have said much weaker. But this, team, with, this uh, team's going to make a run this year. Yeah, they're they're playing really well. They're they've reignited the passion of of Knicks fandom that had frankly kind of been you know I, I I was trying to think of this the other day. So it's it's hard to believe, but the whole Lynn Sanity era is over a decade old, and so right. yeah. that was the last time that I really felt like Knicks fans were 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 excited, crazy, passionate about the team. Um, and so, yeah, I would say that it's, they're more passionate than they have been in probably a decade right now. Okay. Um, you think that's going to last or is it more of a fair weather thing just because they're, they're good this year and it's hard, it's hard to tell how long you can be, you know, how long you're going to be able to sustain that. Yeah, they've 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 had some so adding a so their probably their best player is Jalen Brunson and he mm-hmm. is still kind of on the upswing of his career probably so it's not as if he's a you know he's an older player nearing retirement they they've got a fairly young team so I think there's I think there's a lot of continued excitement but as you said all it would take for them is a Bernard King like injury and and all of a sudden now the the hopes and dreams kind of kind oh. of disappear yeah. Okay, and so if you were, um, you know, to design a basketball game, you know, what would you, you know, what would be the key things for for Adam's hoops game? Man, the 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 holy grail is a, is a hoops game that's playable in a short amount of time, easy to understand, and still generates stats. And so, okay. like. That I, I as as we're recording this, um, you know, play games is is set to reduce or um, uh, produce their kind of uh, full play version of basketball. Yeah, the, the, the um, history maker basketball, right? Yeah, it's it's uh, they they changed the name, but it's it's basically that that project. Okay. Um, and so that you know, we'll see once that comes out. But it's you know, I, I love playing you know cards and dice basketball, but you have to set aside. Two and a half hours, and that's the challenge. Is all the possessions in basketball? There's a lot right. going on, and you know, then you get free throws and the whole bit. So it's kind of, you know, I've been playing a lot of full play football games, and it's taken me two two and a half hours because I'm going play by play by play. Mm-hmm. And when yep. you do it, it's the same thing with basketball. Is that if you want to go play by play and shot by shot, it's just going to be a long game. It's just it have you played regular season basketball? I have, I have. That's what means. I think that's the closest. Dave got that for me for Christmas, and I played it a couple times. And it gives you all the stats that you ever wanted. And you know, you're putting the puzzle together. And I know there are some seasons from that wheelhouse that we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. I just think that that would be that's pretty close. Yeah, I've 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 played that one and I enjoy it. And I do have the I have the seventy nine eighty season for that that I played through some 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 games on. Um, And to me, the only and and. It, it you're right it does as close to that as you can um i i still like it it's not possession by possession and and no. that's a good thing because it makes it play more quickly right but it's also theater of the mind it's um you know yes larry bird had six points in this in this segment but i kind of want to see oh you know he went inside on this one and and his defender wasn't good enough to to guard him and uh, that's, and then that's talking a two and a half hour game so yeah. the brilliant thing about strat on a computer is because i have the uh check for emphasize individual defense to get around the fault of too many offensive fouls because mm-hmm. there are too many offensive fouls in strap basketball. Right. And so you get talking about a theater of the mind when you get, take that shot attempt that it could be off the shooter's card, off your individual defender's card or the team defensive card. I think it's one of the things that makes strat so playable for me. And it sounds like for you too, because it's not just a simple 50, 50 strat system. It's, it right. could be, you know, the team effort or just look, you're going to have to blow by Danny Ainge who's falling asleep. Mm-hmm. That's two. <laughs> so, yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Uh, so you play any other sports games? Yeah, I play. Um, so I have a, a lot of baseball games is, you know, is, is pretty common. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've got, I've got a couple, you know, football, hockey. Uh, I have the play games of, of those. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the only one that I really have multiple games in is, is baseball. And I've got probably, a, you know, 10 or 15 
baseball games. And and so like like with the basketball games, there's things that I enjoy in, in right. all in all the systems and I can appreciate there I've got favorites and again you the episode that you guys talked about games that click. Some of those games clicked and I can play right out of the box. Other times if I even go a day without playing I have to reread the rules and, mm-hmm. yep. and go back through and it just doesn't make sense again. So right. So is there a favorite baseball era? Yeah, so baseball era. Uh, I'm a I'm a Cincinnati Reds fan, and they won the the championship in 1990. So uh, literally the night, you know, the early to mid 90s are kind do, of my wheelhouse. Do I dare favorite. ask what grade you were in in 1990? Let's see. I was in fifth grade, fourth grade. Yeah. God. Uh, 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 my students think my students think I'm ancient. So uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I was a sophomore in college when they won in 1990. They most of that team played up here in Burlington. Oh, that's true. Yeah, right with the Vermont Reds, and yeah. so it's uh, Barry Larkin and Chris Sable and Paul O'Neill, and they all played up here. And the three years that the Reds had their Double A team in Burlington. They won the championship all three years. They never lost up here, wow. which is they came from Waterbury, Connecticut. And then I forgot where they got moved to because we're not that big of a year round market for that. But yeah, they learned Jeff Treadway was on that team as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, but they learned to gel as a unit up here. And the one player that, or one pitcher that, didn't wasn't on that team. I think he was with the Cardinals at that point, but was their ace when they were up here with Scott Terry. Oh yeah, sure. Yep. Uh, he he was the hot prospect in the Reds organization and I forget who they traded him for, but when they won in 90, he was he was in St. Louis. But so, yep. yes, as I I have a special affinity for anyone who beats Canseco and McGuire. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the, that was my very first when I when I got back into Stratomatic that was the, the the season that that hooked me in, and that was that was where I really started my mm-hmm. um, my my interest in in tabletop sports was through the nineteen ninety Reds A's series. So, yep. Have you gamed all the way through since then? Because a lot of people take a break because of real life, and you're obviously busy being a professor. You got your doctorate, by the way, you know, so Doctor Cribley. And so, did you game all the way through that, or did, or did you or did life just kind of take over and you've come back to it? No. So, um, I, I played a little bit of strat, you know, in 1990 and then I took 20 years off probably. And so when my, so I've got three daughters, when my middle daughter was born, um, she, uh, she was very colicky and, and I had to kind of put her in one of those like snuggly things and bounce around. And so there was very little I could do. So I, I, you know, I found the old stratomatic set and pulled it out and, I could roll dice while I was kind of bouncing her, bouncing <laughs> her around. And, uh, that's how I, that's how I got back into it was through a colicky baby. And then, um, again, kind of dropped it for a while. And then 2020 happened and fully engaged with, with tabletop sports because it was, uh, but, but yeah, I took, I took decades off because, you know, again, life happens and, uh, and I, I got more into video games. And, and so the, the tabletop kind of took a back seat. And, and, and the wife is objected for you renaming that child split card. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> That's just a nickname. That's just a nickname. <laughs> <laughs> it's not on the birth certificate or anything like that. No. All, All right. right. So we've been talking to Adam Cribbley. Mm-hmm. He's the author of Kings of the Garden, the New York Knicks and their city. Now, Adam, do you have to be a fan of basketball or the Knicks to enjoy this book? No. I mean, I, I think that anybody with an interest in in history of some kind will find something to enjoy. So I talk a lot about like the rise of hip hop music. So if you are into music, um, there's certainly a, a story for you there. If you're a fan of basketball in general, um, obviously there's a story there. If you like the Knicks, or sorry, if you like uh, New York City, there's a story there. Um, and so the, you know the goal is to make it accessible and, and readable. Uh, you know, not to make it an academic book that that isn't, isn't fun to read and exciting. But I think that, you know, you do have to have some, some interest and love of history in order to enjoy it. Uh, but you certainly don't need to know anything in advance coming in. And, uh, and you certainly don't have to be a basketball fan to, to have a good time with Kings of the Garden. Okay. okay. Where can we, where can we find the book? Where can we buy the book? Uh, it's available Barnes and Noble, Amazon, uh, should be in stores soon, but I know is available online also through Cornell university press, which is, the editor you can find it on there as well. And there's an ebook. There's a, a going to be an audio book, although I don't have a release date on that yet. So um, yeah, so so all the all the major retailers. Is that you gonna have like someone like Morgan Freeman do the audio book? That would be great. 
Now I, let's I talk it, about I've got some ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. New York Knicks. Right. Or maybe cool. Martin Albert, Bob Cott, right? Like they've got <laughs> they've, they've got plenty of free time. I bet you, Mar- I bet you, Marv Albert w- might be interested in doing that, or, or even Kenny He'd Albert. Do a great you know? job, yeah, great a, job. a backbiting experience for sure. Yep. <laughs> so anyway, all right, Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your book again. This has been the Digital Today's podcast, episode two twenty three, and we were shooting threes with Adam Cribbley talking about his uh, basketball book, Kings of the Garden, the New York Knicks in their city. Ways to get a hold of us, Ron, Digital to Dice. Uh, dot com is the website. Nine seven eight seven five one dice is the text line. Digital to dice at yahoo dot com is the email. And over on Facebook, if you like to discuss the show, discuss the book, anything you want over there on Facebook dot com slash groups slash digital to dice. Uh, Ron, thanks for coming on again. As always, and Adam, it's only th- my two hundred and twenty third time, uh, two twenty three, and you're still a special guest. You're still a special guest. I get paid like one too. Yes, you do. <laughs> Adam, <laughs> Adam, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me. All right, bye-bye.